This is Anthony Metivier, and in today's episode of the Magnetic Memory Method podcast, you'll hear from Michael Gussman, a man who was T-boned by an SUV at 55 miles per hour. He had a brain hemorrhage along with multiple body fractures, and his short-term memory was damaged. As it turns out, he used the mnemonic journey method as part of his healing process and found that he was able to remember things without, as he tells us, any effort. He had actually been using memory techniques and mnemonics for approximately a year before the accident occurs, and you'll hear exactly how much of his recovery he attributes to the use of these techniques. And even if you haven't had a car accident yourself, you'll learn how you can place information directly into your long-term memory and have it like turning on a faucet whenever you want to retrieve that memory. You'll learn the various rules that he uses to organize the space in his memory palaces, how to create your own artificial photographic memory using things like the number rhyme. You'll learn about the wax tablet principle from the Ad Herenium, an ancient book that he recommends anyone read if they're interested in memory skills. You'll learn why his memory palace is his largest achievement out of all the memory techniques he has developed and used, and you'll learn about the several hundred thousand pegs for storing information in his long-term memory that he's been able to develop by using simple images like frost and fire. You'll learn how he uses action, exotic images, and even weird smells to help him recall important information. You'll learn exactly how that he memorizes long passages from the Bible, for instance, and why having a good memory and a large vocabulary in a second language can serve as a credential in your life. You'll learn why starting with the number rhyme and the number shape memory techniques may be your ideal starting point for overcoming things like abstent-mindedness in your life. You'll also learn how to teach others using memory palaces by using the very location you're currently in as a demonstration model. And you'll learn about Casper Borman's research into helping Alzheimer's patients recall the names of their loved ones by using their own homes as memory palaces. We're going to talk about why using memory palaces and journey techniques are as simple as putting gravel onto a dirt path and tamping it down. You'll learn how to overcome frustration and deal with ADHD if you happen to suffer from that condition. And you'll learn how to overcome the number one mistake people new to memory techniques make and how to avoid overcomplicating the learning process. You're going to learn exactly how to simplify things for yourself if you're struggling with memory palace and journey techniques. And finally, you'll learn why Michael's organic spaced repetition technique is probably superior to software like Anki if you really want to strengthen the power of your mind. So let's get started. The Magnetic Memory Method is the world's only memorization technique focused solely on the art and craft of the memory palace. What are memory palaces? Put simply, memory palaces are the greatest invention humanity has ever produced. They are mental constructs based on familiar locations from your own life. Mental journeys you can use to memorize and recall anything ranging from foreign language and vocabulary to mathematical formulas, poetry, facts, and the names of important people you meet. Following years of struggle with what he believed to be his poor memory, Anthony Mativier spent hundreds of hours researching, experimenting, and developing a personal network of memory palaces based upon the discovery of a simple strategy that he would use to bring the ancient art of the memory palace into the 21st century. Since releasing the Magnetic Memory Method in his books and video courses, Mativier has helped thousands of people learn and memorize thousands of vocabulary words in languages ranging from Greek, French to Vietnamese, and German to Mandarin. You can memorize and recall anything when you've got a properly constructed set of memory palaces organized in your mind. So let's get started with this episode of the Magnetic Memory Method podcast. Here now is the founder of the Magnetic Memory Method, Anthony Mativier. Tell us a little bit about what happened to you and how you got involved in mnemonics and memory techniques. Well, I started I started a little over a year ago because I, I wanted to memorize scripture with it, and that's why I wanted to learn how to use the memory palace to get into these things because I, I realized it's one thing to memorize a verse, it's a whole other thing to memorize a chapter or something. And so I, I wasn't able to do it, so I started the process of learning how to use the memory systems because of that. About uh, you know, a year later, I, had a, I, was in a ter- I was in a really bad car accident, 
And uh, I got T-boned by, by an SUV, 50, 55 miles an hour in my driver's side door. And I got, I got pretty severely injured. The officer on the scene thought I had died. And then I went to the rehab hospital once they moved me out of uh, trauma ward. I was looking over a speech there because I had a brain hemorrhage during it, and my short-term memory was damaged. It was, uh, it was a bad brain hemorrhage. And uh, it was scary, too. I didn't... I didn't think I was going to be as smart as I am, or was, which I, I've healed, though. I'm okay now. It was frightening not being able to remember things. So I was working with the speech therapist, and she would have me memorize words, like a, a group of words, and then she would put me through these exercises, and at the end of the exercises, I would come back and I would repeat the words to her. I was unable to do that because, because of the damage I had suffered. Now I was frustrated, so I tried using my journey, and it allowed me to remember all the words without any effort. It, it forced the memories. I was able to stick them in, and it worked. It coded directly into the long-term memory, and it got around the damage to my short-term memory. So then I, was, I wasn't going to tell her what I did. I was you know, let her think I, you know, didn't remember it. And I felt the Holy Spirit say, Mike, tell her what you did. And I didn't want to. I wasn't going to tell her. Um, I'm like, Lord, is that you? And he was like, Mike, tell her what you did. Tell her what you did. So I told her what I did and how I used my memory system. And I explained, you know, a little bit about what they were and how they worked. And she was like, that's fantastic. This is absolutely amazing. Can you teach a seminar on this? Or can you teach seminars? And can you come in and help our stroke patients? Because that would, that's what gets damaged in a stroke patient their short-term memory. And this is the way around that because my short-term memory was damaged. And I was able to use this to cut through the problems with it. They've had me come in to Schumer Rehab Hospital. And I saw their other memory experts. And she does something completely different. They don't even, they don't touch on these systems at all. And uh, so I start March 14th. I start teaching seminars. Or I'll start with the first one. To the stroke patients there in the rehab. What, for people who haven't experienced memory loss, what does it feel like? Picture it like you go across the room to pick up a notebook and you get over to the other side of the room and you don't remember what you left to get. Or you're, you pick up your phone to call somebody and then you forget that you're calling somebody and you're like, why am I holding my phone? And you, you, know, you go put it away and then you don't remember that what you were doing and you're like, oh, I'm standing in this other part of the room. I'm not sure why I'm there. It's, it's frustrating. It's uh. It's scary, too, honestly. It was, it was not a good experience. What were some of the reactions of the people around you and your family and your work when your memory changed to such an extent like that? They were worried. Honestly, they were scared for me. They are, it, was a, it, was, it was a very severe accident, and everybody was pretty frightened about the damage I received. Cause I, I had a fractured spine, and my pelvis was fractured, and, and then the memory problems. I mean, they'd come in and visit me, and I wouldn't remember that they were visiting I had a lot of people come and visit, though. My church really sent out a lot of people. To what, to what extent do you attribute much of your recovery of your memory to the actual usage of the memory techniques, such as the journey method and memory palace method that you were using with this nurse? Well, truthfully, it taught me to start using areas in my mind that had been damaged, so I can only imagine that the growth was... It was surprising, honestly. You give me like a list of five words or something... And I couldn't remember what they are, but I'd stick them in. I'd stick them in the system. Twenty minutes later, or two hours later, I could still remember the word. But I, I, it was utterly impossible for me to do it without. What does that feel like when you're able to recall information, even just simple stuff like a list of words? It felt really good. Honestly, it was uplifting to my spirit. It was, I was, it was, it was very traumatic. With everything that happened. And, it felt good to be able to succeed at something, just something simple like that. How does that feeling compare to in the year or so before? What's that feeling that you have when you are able to memorize stuff or recall stuff after having using uh, memory techniques compared to being able to recall something after using memory techniques after such a, a major accident? I appreciate it more. And mm -hmm. honestly, I think these techniques are amazing. I can't even picture trying to memorize stuff without them anymore. It's just, these things are fantastic. It's like using cheat codes in a video game to memorize anything you want. Well, just for people who are not really familiar that much with what we were talking about, how would you describe the journey method or a memory palace? And are they the same thing? It's all about the method of location. You have a predetermined set of memories because you, you code into your long-term memory and you create, like, I, I usually use, I use systems of 10. So I'll have 10 items or 10 places or pegs or different terms for it. So that way, you know, I can know the eighth item on the list compared to the fourth one. That's why you have a, I have a system of numbering, which is the location. And then each one of those has a picture that goes along with it. And when I see the picture, I think of, I think of the item. And the strength I'm able to recall when I stick into it is by the strength of how well I know the long-term memory. So if I look at this 
like the fourth location of a journey for six weeks or something, I know that location very well. And the strength that I know that location is how well I memorize whatever it is I stick into it. The journey is, is, is places, it's is a system of order of, of location that is in like, say I started my front door and I go into town, I and mean, it's the 10 places that stick out to me the most between my front door and town. I mean, those are the, and you know, I always know, like, place four will always be the same thing, place six will always be the same thing, and I make, I make every fifth one gold. So that's what they dark around the adherinium. But, uh, well, it doesn't matter. I make the fifth one gold, so my mind, especially when you start building up large numbers, your mind can slip through them, and it'll catch the one that's gold, so you can count more easily. Right, right. And it gets to where you just turn, it, it gets to where you, it's like turning on a faucet of how quickly your mind falls through these images, and it sees anything that's different from the image. I mean, that's the memory that you're trying to remember. But it, that, that when you add into it, it's still remembered at the strength of the original long-term memory. Right. And, it, and it cuts through, it even cuts through brain damage. I mean, it's, it's amazing. You use this uh, term, cutting through. Did you say more about that? What, what do you mean by cutting through? What I mean is, it's this way to skip your short-term memory. When you use things in a memory system, you're not memorizing it by your short-term memory. You're, you're putting whatever you want to remember directly into a long-term memory. So when I say cutting through or skipping, an example would be my, my short-term memory was damaged, so I wasn't able to use it. But I was still able to remember these things by, by using these systems because the system's strength is based on the long-term memory in the system of order that they come in. I've been like, you know, if I was to use a memory palace, a memory palace would be, uh, you know, I use top to bottom, left to right, corners to walls, is where I come into the room. So the system never changes. It doesn't matter what room I make into a palace, it'll always be in the same order and compilation as every other room I ever make. So that way it'll never get confusing if I have large mouth stuff. It's always in a system of 10. And so I'll have 10 long-term memories in a room that is the system of location. And each of those 10 long-term memories are things I can stick something I want to remember into. And then I use... You know, then I'll have ten rooms, and then I can I can multiply the rooms by doing the same rooms, but I'll I'll make them like frosted. I'll make all the pegs inside of the room frosted, so then that that hundred that hundred long term memories becomes two hundred, and then that can go all the way up to very high numbers. How did you first become interested in in memory techniques? What's the what's the the entry into into this set of techniques? I couldn't just remember everything I wanted to and I was spending all this time trying to remember things and I, I couldn't do it so I started just kind of combing through the internet I got a I, got, I bought a book on it and uh, I just started applying them and I, I started with the small systems and I, I started looking into the people from the past and how they did it like St. Uh, Thomas Aquinas St. Augustine and I looked into Summa Theologica the Ad Herinium about Cicero, and I got into what they did in the old days with the old orators and stuff, and how did they memorize all these things? I wanted to memorize scripture. I wanted to memorize very large amounts of scripture. And it is just not feasibly possible for most 99.9% .9 of the population to do it without a system like this. Like, there are those that photographic memory, but, you know, this is basically an artificial photographic memory. Of all the people you mentioned, Cicero and St. Uh, Aquinas and so forth. Is there a favorite that you have that you would recommend people check out? I like St. Thomas Aquinas with the Summa Theologica. He had a really good statement in there. He said, that start with the small string. He was working on the gift of knowledge. And I did that with the memory systems because I didn't understand them. And it's like, I, I didn't start out with a memory palace. I started out with the, the number rhyme. And then I went to the, the journey. And then I went to the number shape. And then, you know, those built. Those built the skills so I can uh, understand it. I started small, and then it grew very large very quickly. The Adherinium, I think it's chapter 3, verse 16 to 24, is the ones where he really gets into the systems, and he talks about them as being wax tablets that you stick things into. That was, and those are the background images that uh, are going to journey with the locations. And that's where I got every fifth one being gold also. Right. Yeah, the wax tablet metaphor is really great. So you've talked about starting small and sort of adding new systems as you go along. To what extent do you think you've modified those systems to your own style, or do you sort of use them as prescribed? I use them generally as prescribed, honestly. And uh, the, 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 the one I would say I did more myself, although I uh, would be my palace, 
And that, that's the one I, I personal, personalized the most. That's not only my, my large achievement in the, in the memory systems was getting a, a working, fully functional, powerful memory palace. So what, what makes it working and fully functional? It's technically, a, it's 10 rooms of 10, and there's technically an 11th room, which I made in my garage, it's, which is the index system, indexing for the rest of it. I skipped bathrooms and closets because it's it sort I, I designed it specifically for memorizing scriptures, so I, I dig out rooms and I would be awkward to add anything uh, scripture related into certain items in there. And uh, then I, I wanted something large enough, and I wasn't sure what I wanted to initially start with, so I, I might have overkilled it a little bit. So I worked it out to where it can handle a couple hundred thousand pegs. I've never gotten anywhere near that high. It turns out that's quite a bit more than you actually need. Yeah. Don't need to work that high. <laughs> I, 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 I never needed to go to 250,000 pegs in any system. But it is, it is possible, right? It is possible. I mean, it is, it's, it's so easy because once you get that additional 100, that multiplier system, it's, to get up to 1,000, it's just 10 more items you have to memorize. But then it's do everything frosted, and then do everything in animal fur, and then do, or do everything in, in uh, you know, make all the pegs on fire. It's the same thing. You just change, it's in the same room, you just change the structure of how that item is made. Like instead of, like say I have a, a painting I know, well that, it'll be that same painting covered in frost. And then it works as like a, it's a whole new way to memorize it then. And it, take, it takes a little practice to do it, but it works then. And it's like a whole new room then. So then I just add 10 more items, and I've gone from 100 to 1,000. And then from there you go, 10 more items, and you go from 1,000 to 100,000. I'm sorry, 10,000. Sounds like you have a lot of fun with it. I do. I honestly, I, uh, I enjoy it. It's, it's an exciting thing. I, it's an accomplishment, I feel. These are, these things are really cool. I wish, I think they should teach these in school and whatnot when people were growing up. I mean, I wish I had learned this when I was younger. It can sound a bit confusing and complicated, but once you start, I mean, it's just, it is so easy, and one thing just falls on top of another. Yeah, I think it's something we hear a lot as people who use these techniques that people find it incomprehensible, very difficult. Why on earth would you want to do that? Some people tell me a lot that it would just be easier to just do rote learning. Why do you think that people find it so so difficult? You know, I've wondered it too because I've tried to get I've tried to get my friends interested in it. I've tried to get people at the church interested in it. I mean, one or two people be like, "That's cool. I should do it," but they. They just blow it up. It's I don't know why. You know, it's like I'm trying to tell them this amazing thing, and they're just they just won't listen. It's it's so frustrating. You're like, come on, guys, it'll take you one day to get some of these systems down, and then you can do this. So you talked about memorizing scripture. How successful have you been? I'm still working. I'm currently memorizing the first epistle of John right now, and I'm in chapter two. Um, we'd have to take your word for it, but do you care to give a sample? That which was from the beginning, which we have heard and we have seen and have looked upon, and our hands have handled, concerning the word of life. Two, the life that was manifested, uh, that we have seen and bear witness, and declare to you that which was with the Father from the beginning, or that which was with the Father, and was made manifest to us. Three, that which we have, that which we have seen and heard, and declare to you, that you may have, you should declare that you also may have fellowship with us, and truly our fellowship is with the Father and with the Son, Jesus Christ. And these things we write to you for, and these things that we write to you that your joy may be full. This is the message that we have heard and declare to you that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. What's happening in your mind when you're reciting these scriptures? I am, I'm walking through, I'm, I'm walking through rooms. And when I get to the room, I'm, re I'm basically, I see the pictures that I've added into it, and then the words just kind of show up. How do you create the pictures in the first place? Um, association. It's, uh, and sometimes I'll use substitution. Basically, you make anything, like really, you crash or penetrate into something, or you're merging or wrapping around or rotating. I use action a lot. Action's really good. And or I'll, I'll use things that are violent or sensual. Something that triggers something like really exotic, like being a weird smell or color, or you know they're vibrating or dancing. You make it, you make it as strange, kind of like children. Children don't have a problem with coming up with imagination and being like crazy and playing games and stuff. It's basically relearning to use that skill 
is a thing. And that, and that takes a little bit of effort to start coming up, knowing how to come up with the pictures. But once you, it doesn't take long to get the hang of it. I and mean, then you stick them in, and you crash it together into the into the into what was already there. And mm -hmm. then and then they're stuck. And then then whatever you stuck into it is remembered by the strength of what the location was. I noticed once or twice as you were reciting. You know what's happening in that per that precise moment when you just kind of need to correct yourself somewhat. I'm very nervous because I'm being interviewed. Well, I did. I could sit there over and read this stuff in my head without a problem, and then I try to I try to do it in front of people, and it makes me makes me a little shy. Sometimes a couple a couple of words I, I I do go off on, especially with you know depending on the translation. And it's a uh, there's a lot of thises and days and and thous, and it it can be a little difficult. I've tried creating try to get around that with things that come from for small words that have to do with the syntax or the grammar of the sentence. You still, it's really easy to get the point, but, some, but it takes a little effort work to, like the work to get work to work. Right, right. Yeah, I, I, people ask me about that, and I also deal with it myself with, you know, filler words, like you're saying, thee and thou. Do you find that those are really not that essential to focus on, or do you have a sort of stock image that you use to pick them up? I have created a shorthand for some of them. I don't think they're quite, especially if you're doing just like large, large amounts, I wouldn't focus too much on it. I mean, I'd like to get them anyways just because I think it kind of looks cool to have them right, but it's still important, but it's not essential. And it comes down to personal, personal taste, I suppose, of what, what the person's striving for. But in other words, if you wanted to get it word for word, you could it'd just be a matter of dealing with those these and thous, so to speak. Right, and I, if you want to get a word for word, I would make a shorthand for those things. A specific type of picture for certain words that are that are the most common and reoccurring. So I count up the ones that seem to be used the most, and they can be taken change for each chapter, but if you're trying to memorize like a, like the gospel, like one of the gospels, you know, you're going to have a set, because there's a different style of writing for each one a little bit, so you're going to have to make a shorthand designed around that if you want to get it exactly word for word. This is all really exciting and the results are pretty obvious. What else do you use mnemonics to memorize? Actually, I, I, I'm learning Hebrew and I found I can stick in words or I'll use substitution form. Yeah, I, I don't do it in very, I don't do it in bulk amounts. I'll do like, you know, I'll add five, ten more words for the day and then I'll, you know, in the morning I'll set them in like one of my, I, I use the journey probably most frequently for this. Battles I use for the scripture about the journey. I'll, and you know, that way throughout the day, I can just look at the words again, and it just it just remembers them, and I'll you know, memorize an extra 10 or 15 words of Hebrew that day. And you're doing classical or, or biblical Hebrew or modern Hebrew? Modern Hebrew. I'm starting with modern. Okay. And I've been doing it for about a, about a year also. I'm at about, about a 500 word vocabulary, or maybe a 600. Okay, that's excellent. What attracts you to Hebrew uh, in particular? It's used. It's still, it's the only dead language to ever start getting spoken again. As religious uses, like, it's, uh, it's good to have that ability to translate if you're getting into... I work a lot in ministry, so things in Hebrew come up pretty frequently. And it's like, a, it's like a pretty solid credential also. It's a credential to make people, you know, take it more seriously what I'm saying. Because they start going into, what about the translation from this, or we've lost this and these translations. And it's like, well, no, we haven't really. It's still the same thing. This is what it's saying. This is what it means. You know, there's like the messianic insight into the different, the different letters and the vowels, and they have the way they write words and the way they used to write like the Torah scrolls. Or, but again, that's I'm still learning modern though, so it helps though. So if you you're going to be teaching people, if you when, when you teach them, what do you think is the you know the number one thing that someone learning mnemonics for the first time should tackle? I would start them with I'm going to start them with the number rhyme. I'm going to show them the difference between the number rhyme and the number shape. And I'm going to start them with a the journey. And then I'll explain the major system of how to turn numbers into pictures. And maybe the link, like for something, I, I'm going to try to cater to, or I am catering it around to uh, things like absent mindedness. People being, they, they can't remember people's names, so I'm going to target, target the faces, you know, making files from the body feature and then databases for names and stuff. But, you know, you know, everybody's going to have a different strengths and weaknesses. That's why I'll do the difference between the number rock and the number shape. It's just how to, it's how to make a system of location into pictures. And where could somebody find information about that if they wanted to know more? Probably you. Right? You seem like you know what you're doing extremely well. I would like your website. 
Yeah, there's certainly some stuff. I mean, when you talk about the number rhyme, you're talking about like one is a gun, two is a shoe, that sort of system? Yeah, one gun, two shoe, three tree. Right. Yeah, I've definitely got that on my website. And also I teach some of the major system as well. And obviously the journey method is my favorite inside of memory palaces. Do you use the journey inside memory palace? Yeah, almost exclusively. The reason being that the location is contained in structures that have easy to memorize patterns. So really, if you think about it, the last hotel room you were in, you probably can remember the layout quite well. And boom, you've got maybe 10 stations, 10 different spots inside of that hotel room that you can use to create a short journey. And one of the reasons why it's so easy to do that is because it is a location and the mind somehow has an amazing ability to memorize contained locations like buildings and rooms. That's true. No, that's, that's exciting. That's a really good idea. I try to avoid making journeys outside. However, I will, you know, if I need to add more stations onto along the journey onto a building, then I will go outside and I have some principles that I follow in order to ensure the success of, of those outside journeys. But I prefer inside. And there's just another thing about the inside rule, so to speak, is that you get to visit so many new places and collect new memory palaces. You can go to friends, you can go to movie theaters, art galleries, like I said, hotel rooms. Every place I've visited, I was, you know, pay a little bit extra attention to the hotel room. And you wind up with just dozens of memory palaces just simply by paying attention to where you are. And again, that contained nature of a building just gives you almost automatically four corners in every room and other features. So it's quite lovely. That's impressive. And one thing that you might consider when you're teaching people, it's certainly something that I've done with students when I've had the opportunity to teach in a classroom, is to use the actual place that you're teaching as, as a memory palace, as a location. So have them create an image and stick it in the corner of the room and then in the, in the opposite corner of the room and then go from there. And you can, you can guide them through the process of moving from station to station. Okay. Yeah, that's a good idea. And locations is one of the things that they're able to remember. So I even know, like, I, I research into, like, aphasia patients. That's one of the things they can still do. They can still do locations and they can still do spaces, even though everything else is blocked or damaged. Yeah, I don't know if you're aware of Casper Borman's research, but he's using Memory Palace training to help people with Alzheimer's remember the names of their loved ones. And it relies heavily on the idea that they have some ability to navigate their own homes. And so he's creating virtual renditions of their homes and basically showing them animated images of a journey through their home and creating associative imagery for them to help them recall the names of their of their loved ones, which is just absolutely fantastic research. I'll have to look into that, honestly, because uh, the, the important thing, for, at least for me here, is I want to be able to, I want to really help these people. Like, I went in there, and a couple, a couple of those cases there were, were really touching. I mean, they were they were sad the damage that those people had gone through, and and, a, and an opportunity to help them. I mean, I am I am completely open to anything that can help them more. Well, by all means, we can keep in touch and shoot ideas back and forth. And I'd love to get another interview with you again in a couple months or so to see how you're doing. I would love to do that. That would be an amazing resource, and honestly, that that's really cool. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. I appreciate that. So just to get back to you. You're the guy who wrote the book on this stuff. <laughs> well, one of them. There's a, there's a lot of people, and I always think that the more the merrier. The, the more there are, the more chances are that people will find their way to this stuff. I once was able to interview Harry Lorraine, and he told me something very interesting, which was that even just hearing about memory techniques will already improve your memory because they're so fascinating, and the, just the idea that you could use you know, these mystical techniques or seemingly mystical techniques will already give you some sort of boost in your memory because you'll simply just have the idea that it could be better and that kind of leads you along the path, hopefully. Just hearing about memory techniques already helps your memory. It makes people start thinking. Exactly. So of these... Start creating associations and emotional associations to things. Start giving the thoughts away. Yeah, I like, I like how you talk about them having power and... Uh, and the, the the strength of the of the association is really what determines the power of recall. That's a really great uh, image uh, or idea that it, they have strength, and the more strength they have, the more you're assisted in recall. Of all the techniques that you've mentioned, do you have a favorite? The journey method. 
Journey is my favorite. The Journey and the Palace. Those are my, my two favorite techniques. I, I'll use my number rhyme and stuff with the number shape for like shopping lists. You know, if I'm going out and I need a you know, I need a memorized quick set of errands or things I need to get from the store, I'll I'll toss it in there. But my my favorite system is my journey and then the palace. Any particular reason why? It was the first one I really saw how amazing this stuff is and it just kind of stuck. And I just I've used it the most frequently, so the images are the most it's almost like the more times you use that peg, the stronger, you know, just, it, just, yeah, it just keeps getting stronger the more you use it, so I've, I've used it the most. So it has the most strength of all my of all my systems. You'd say that use reinforces the technique? Yes, quite a bit. It's almost like you have to, like, it's, it's like putting gravel on a pathway, and then over, over a couple, of course, a couple months of, like, heavy traffic, the gravel just gets worked into the ground, and you keep adding more gravel, more gravel, and it just becomes... It really strengthens the path. It's like putting gravel on a path and then walking it into the path so that it just kind of gets it gets stamped into the ground and it just strengthens the path. That's kind of how I look at the more you use the peg, the stronger it gets. Right, that's a beautiful image of the gravel. Obviously, you've experienced a boost in memory, but have you noticed any other benefits of using these techniques in your life? And what sort of benefits does that bring? I mean, just my ability to memorize things in general is increasing. Just because I'm using it so frequently, and I, it just knocks out frustration from absent-mindedness a lot, I tell you. I have, I have, I have ADHD, so I, uh, I can get a little sporadic at times, and this is, this kind of calms it. You haven't started teaching yet, but what do you think, uh, in your experience, if you know anybody else, or, you know, you, you're on nemotechnics.org, as I am, what, uh, what kind of mistakes do you think that people make when they first start learning mnemonics? They get overcomplicated. They overcomplicate it and they try to make... I remember when I made a journey and then I tried to change it after I made it. The difficulty in, in that cause. Cause you, you, if you do engrave a memory, get an engraved memory. It's really hard. It's the mute little differences of not, of not realizing... But they don't realize just how firm these memories get in their mind. And so... You gotta, you gotta get the system. I use everything on system is ten of ten. It's a. Uh, you want to make sure you pick the right one to start because if you do it and you want to change it halfway through, it can be really frustrating. Have you dealt with that a lot? Trying to change journeys. I personally dealt with that, and I did some damage to my one of my very systems because of that. It's better now. It was a long time ago, but I remember. That got really confusing really quickly. Just because my I recall things and it would pop out of my mind and it would put the answer, but it would it would do it from the other one, and so I got my method of location mixed up in one of them, and it was uh it was frustrating. And I would recommend planning for things like that or having somebody show you how to do it so that you don't make that, that misstep. Were you able to find anybody to show you in advance? Uh, no, I used to. Uh, mnemonictechnique.org a lot. I used that when I'd have questions or I'd, I would pray about them because a couple of times I got stumped and I, I had to pray about it. Hey, <laughs> not did the Lord help me? But I haven't had anybody, I haven't had anybody helping me because I did it, I had to do it all, I had to do it all myself. And it was, uh, it was hard. And looking back at some of the questions I asked, I mean, they just, looking at them now, they didn't even make sense. I mean, it was just like, it was crazy. <laughs> like, it had nothing to do with anything that was being applied to the system at all. Uh, I made them really confusing in my mind, and these things are not confusing. They're, they're, they're not... I overcomplicated it, and that confused me is what I need to say. And it was... I really needed to take a, a smaller step and keep it simple, and that's how they work so well. Is there any specific way that someone struggling could step back and make it a little simpler for themselves? If one system's being confusing, try a different one. And then you can, because, you know, you do one or two of them, or you get it from another perspective, you broaden your perspective a little bit, and it probably helps fill in the questions about the first one you were having, if you were having trouble with. And I found that's what I did. I experimented with a lot of, a lot of different systems, and uh, I found that helped a lot. Because I, I couldn't make sense of one, so I'd go and do two or three others. I'd do the smaller, simpler ones. And then I would understand the one I was struggling with. Do you have any thoughts on 
spaced repetition software like Anki or anything like that? Um, I looked at it, but I don't. I'm not personally versed with it. I, I mean, I, I read about it a bit. I mean, I do. I do follow the, the kind of the, the loose set of time frame. Like, you know, you do it. You do it once, and you do it thirty seconds later, and you do it two minutes later, and five minutes, and, and half an hour, and an hour. And you do it in the afternoon, and you do it the following day, or three days later, then a week later, and a you know a couple months later. And I believe there is a set time frame to program into your long term memory. It's like you get it in there, it will hold for X amount period of time, and you got to get the next the next time stuck in there, and then it's there forever. So I do believe in that, and I've seen positive results in how I've spaced my the repetition. For going through things. You do your repetition sequences completely independent of uh, technology. Yes, I do it completely independently of the technology. Do you suspect there's a benefit from from doing it that way, or honestly, I have to I have to actually sit down and use Anki and compare them. And I, you know, there's a possibility that I will I will at some point get to that. Well, are there any aspects of mnemonics or memory techniques or memory in general that I haven't asked you about that you think people really need to know about? I think it's covered pretty well. I think they all need to try it. They should at least, at least, at least learn one of, at least learn a journey. I think they can judge for themselves just how amazing it is. It's almost hard to believe just how awesome these things are until you use one and you're like, wow, I can't believe it just works that well. <laughs> it's, it's almost like you get... You get stunned by it. You're like, what in the world? How is this working that way? How is this even possible? Thank you for listening to the Magnetic Memory Method podcast. Remember, anything someone else has done can be done by you as well, as long as you learn how. Thank you for listening to this interview with Michael Gussman and to the Magnetic Memory Method podcast. If you're ready to leap forward and get really serious about building a successful memorization system for yourself so that you can learn a new language and recall its vocabulary with ease or many other things that you might want to memorize, here's what you can do right now. Over the years, I've developed a complete practical and language learning oriented memorization program containing great ideas you can use immediately to improve your vocabulary memorization skills and experience a boost in fluency as a result. And you can use this to memorize other stuff as well. In my full home study program, which I call How to Learn and Memorize the Vocabulary of Any Language, you get more than four solid hours of video training and well over 700 pages of training, checklists, and worksheets to increase your vocabulary in any language you may be studying and boost your fluency as well as improve your memory overall. In this course, you learn the best ways to build memory palaces for learning and memorizing foreign language vocabulary using a simple three-step formula. You'll learn a method for memorizing the genders and cases of different words. You'll learn the most important words to focus on so that your boosts in vocabulary are meaningful and instantly useful in conversations. You'll learn to systematically divide words into component parts so that you'll not only know what words mean after you've learned them, but ultimately you'll be able to guess what new words probably mean, even if you haven't heard them before in the language you're studying. You'll learn how to put together a knockout vocabulary memorization schedule that will give you dozens of new words every time you practice. And above all, you'll learn how to make memorizing foreign language vocabulary automatic, thrilling, and fun. And i got to be honest with you, there's much, much more. So please visit www.magneticmemorymethod.com today. You'll find the link to the video course in the sidebar, watch the promo video and the free lesson it contains, join the course, and start benefiting right away. Now, I personally guarantee you that you'll be delighted with this program and that it will help you memorize dozens of words every time you study. You can try it for an entire 30 days. It's hosted at Udemy. They have an amazing return policy. So if you're not satisfied for any reason whatsoever, I insist that you send it back to me for a full refund. My program, How to Learn and Memorize the Vocabulary of Any Language, will give you a series of step-by-step formulas to build a successful network of memory palaces that will allow you to memorize and recall foreign language vocabulary at will. Join the course online today.